Otho, from the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson, and edited by T. Forrester. Otho The ancestors of Otho were originally of the town of Ferentum, of an ancient and honourable family, and indeed one of the most considerable in Etruria. His grandfather, Marcus Salvius Otho, whose father was Roman knight, but his mother of mean extraction, for it is not certain whether she was free-born, by the favour of Livia Augusta, in whose house he had his education, was made a senator, but never rose higher than the praetorship. His father, Lucius Otho, was by the mother's side nobly descended, allied to several great families, and so dearly beloved by Tiberius, and so much resembled him in his features, that most people believed Tiberius was his father. He behaved with great strictness and severity, not only in the city offices, but in the proconsulship of Africa, and some extraordinary commands in the army. He had the courage to punish with death some soldiers in Illyricum, who, in the disturbance attempted by Camillus, upon changing their minds, had put their generals to the sword as promoters of that insurrection against Claudius. He ordered the execution to take place in the front of the camp and under his own eyes, though he knew they had been advanced to higher ranks in the army by Claudius on that very account. By this action he acquired fame, but lessened his favour at court, which, however, he soon recovered by discovering to Claudius a design upon his life carried on by a Roman knight, and which he had learnt from some of his slaves. For the Senate ordered a statue of him to be erected in the palace, an honour which had been conferred but upon very few before him, and Claudius advanced him to the dignity of a patrician, commending him at the same time in the highest terms and concluding with these words a man than whom i don't so much as wish to have children that should be better he had two sons by a very noble woman albia terentia namely lucius titianus and a younger called marcus who had the same cognomen as himself he had also a daughter whom he contracted to Drusus, Germanicus's son, before she was of marriageable age. The Emperor Otho was born upon the 4th of the Canons of May, in the consulship of Camillus Aruntius and Domitius Enobarbus. He was, from his earliest youth, so riotous and wild, that he was often severely scourged by his father. He was said to run about in the night-time, and seize upon any one he met who was either drunk or too feeble to make resistance, and toss him in a blanket. After his father's death, to make his court the more effectually to a freedwoman about the palace, who was in great favour, he pretended to be in love with her, though she was old and almost decrepit. Having by her means got into Nero's good graces, he soon became one of the principal favourites, by the congeniality of his disposition to that of the emperor, or, as some say, by the reciprocal practice of mutual pollution. He had so great a sway at court, that when a man of consular rank was condemned for bribery, having tampered with him for a large sum of money to procure his pardon, before he had quite effected it, he scrupled not to introduce him into the Senate to return his thanks. Having, by means of this woman, insinuated himself into all the Emperor's secrets, he, 
upon the day designed for the murder of his mother, entertained them both at a very splendid feast, to prevent suspicion. Poppea Sabina, for whom Nero entertained such a violent passion that he had taken her from her husband and entrusted her to him, he received, and went through the form of marrying her. And not satisfied with obtaining her favours, he loved her so extravagantly that he could not with patience bear Nero for his rival. It is certainly believed that he not only refused admittance to those who were sent by Nero to fetch her, but that on one occasion he shut him out, and kept him standing before the door, mixing prayers and menaces in vain, and demanding back again what was entrusted to his keeping. His pretended marriage, therefore, being dissolved, he was sent lieutenant into Lusitania. This treatment of him was thought sufficiently severe, because harsher proceedings might have brought the whole farce to light, which, notwithstanding, at last came out, and was published to the world in the following distich. Cur otho mentitus sit, quaritis exulonore, oxoris moitus, Caeperat esse suae. You ask why Otho's banished? No, the cause comes not within the verge of vulgar laws. Against all rules of fashionable life, the rogue had dared to sleep with his own wife. He governed the province in quality of quaestor for ten years, with singular moderation and justice. As soon as an opportunity of revenge offered, he readily joined in Galba's enterprises, and at the same time conceived hopes of obtaining the imperial dignity for himself. To this he was much encouraged by the state of the times, but still more by the assurances given him by Sir Lucas the astrologer, who, having formally told him that he would certainly outlive Nero, came to him at that juncture unexpectedly, promising him again that he should succeed to the empire, and that in a very short time. He therefore let slip no opportunity of making his court to every one about him by all manner of civilities. As often as he entertained Galba at supper, he distributed to every man of the cohort which attended the emperor on guard a gold piece, endeavouring likewise to oblige the rest of the soldiers in one way or another. Being chosen an arbitrator by one who had a dispute with his neighbour about a piece of land, he bought it and gave it him, so that now almost everybody thought and said that he was the only man worthy of succeeding to the empire. He entertained hopes of being adopted by Galba, and expected it every day, but finding himself disappointed by Piso's being preferred before him, he turned his thoughts to obtaining his purpose by the use of violence, and to this he was instigated as well by the greatness of his debts as by resentment at Galba's conduct towards him, for he did not conceal his conviction that he could not stand his ground unless he became emperor and that it signified nothing whether he fell by the hands of his enemies in the field, or of his creditors in the forum. He had a few days before squeezed out of one of the emperor's slaves a million of sesterces for procuring him a stewardship, and this was the whole fund he had for carrying on so great an enterprise. At first the design was entrusted to only five of the guard, but afterwards to ten others, each of the five naming two. They had every one ten thousand sesterces paid down, and were promised fifty thousand more. By these others were drawn in, but not many, from a confident assurance that when the matter came to the crisis they should have enough to join them. His first intention was, immediately after the departure of Piso, 
to seize the camp and fall upon Galba whilst he was at supper in the palace. But he was restrained by a regard for the cohort at that time on duty, lest he should bring too great an odium upon it. Because it happened that the same cohort was in guard before, both when Caius was slain and Nero deserted. For some time afterwards he was restrained also by scruples about the omens, and by the advice of Seleucus. Upon the day fixed at last for the enterprise, having given his accomplices notice to wait for him in the forum near the temple of Saturn, at the gilded milestone, he went in the morning to pay his respects to Galba, and being received with a kiss as usual, he attended him at sacrifice, and heard the predictions of the augur. A freedman of his, then bringing him word that the architects were come, which was the signal agreed upon, he withdrew, as if it were with a design to view a house upon sale, and went out by a back door of the palace to the place appointed. Some say he pretended to be seized with an ague fit, and ordered those about him to make that excuse for him, if he was inquired after. Being then quickly concealed in a woman's litter, he made the best of his way for the camp. But the bearers growing tired, he got out and began to run. His shoe becoming loose, he stopped again, but being immediately raised by his attendants upon their shoulders, and unanimously saluted by the title of Emperor, he came amidst auspicious acclamations, and drawn swords into the Principia in the camp, all who met him joining in the cavalcade as if they had been privy to the design. Upon this, sending some soldiers to dispatch Galba and Piso, he said nothing else in his address to the soldiery to secure their affections than these few words, I shall be content with whatever ye think fit to leave me. Towards the close of the day, he entered the Senate, and after he had made a short speech to them, pretending that he had been seized in the streets, and compelled by violence to assume the imperial authority, which he designed to exercise in conjunction with them, he retired to the palace. Besides other compliments which he received from those who flocked about him to congratulate and flatter him, he was called Nero by the mob and manifested no intention of declining that cognomen. Nay, some authors relate that he used it in his official acts, and the first letters he sent to the governors of provinces. He suffered all his images and statues to be replaced, and restored his procurators and freedmen to their former posts, and the first writing which he signed as emperor was a promise of fifty millions of sesterces to finish the golden house. He is said to have been greatly frightened that night in his sleep, and to have groaned heavily, and being found by those who came running in to see what the matter was, lying upon the floor before his bed, he endeavoured, by every kind of atonement, to appease the ghost of Galba, by which he had found himself violently tumbled out of bed. The next day, as he was taking the omens, a great storm arising and sustaining a grievous fall, he muttered to himself from time to time, Tigar moi kaimakois aulois. What business have I the loud trumpets to sound? About the same time the armies in Germany took an oath to Vitellius as emperor. Upon receiving this intelligence he advised the senate to send thither deputies to inform them that a prince had been already chosen, and to persuade them to peace and a good understanding. By letters and messages, however, he offered Vitellius to make him his colleague in the empire, and his son-in-law. But a war being now unavoidable, and the generals and troops sent forward by Vitellius advancing, he had a proof of the attachment and fidelity of the Praetorian guards, which had nearly proved fatal to the senatorian order. 
it had been judged proper that some arms should be given out of the stores and conveyed to the fleet by the marine troops. While they were employed in fetching these from the camp in the night, some of the guards suspecting treachery excited a tumult, and suddenly the whole body, without any of their officers at their head, ran to the palace, demanding that the entire senate should be put to the sword, and having repulsed some of the tribunes who endeavoured to stop them, and slain others, they broke, all bloody as they were, into the banqueting room, inquiring for the emperor, nor would they quit the place until they had seen him. He now entered upon his expedition against Vitellius, with great alacrity, but too much precipitation, and without any regard to the ominous circumstances which attended it. For the Ancilia had been taken out of the Temple of Mars for the usual procession, but were not yet replaced, during which interval it had of old been looked upon as very unfortunate to engage in any enterprise. He likewise set forward upon the day when the worshippers of the mother of the gods begin their lamentations and wailing. Besides these, other unlucky omens attended him, for in a victim offered to Father Dis, he found the signs such as upon all other occasions are regarded as favourable, whereas in that sacrifice the contrary intimations are judged the most propitious. At his first setting forward he was stopped by inundations of the Tiber, and at twenty miles distance from the city found the road blocked up by the fall of houses. Though it was the general opinion that it would be proper to protract the war, as the enemy were distressed by famine and the strictness of their quarters, yet he resolved with equal rashness to force them to an engagement as soon as possible, whether from impatience of prolonged anxiety, and in the hope of bringing matters to an issue before the arrival of Vitellius, or because he could not resist the ardour of the troops who were all clamorous for battle. He was not, however, present at any of those which ensued, but stayed behind at Brixellum. He had the advantage in three slight engagements near the Alps, about Placentia, at a place called Castors, but was, by a fraudulent stratagem of the enemy, defeated in the last and greatest battle at Bedriacum. For, some hopes of a conference being given, and the soldiers being drawn up to hear the conditions of peace declared, very unexpectedly, and amidst their mutual salutations, they were obliged to stand to their arms. Immediately upon this, he determined to put an end to his life, more as many think, and not without reason, out of shame, at persisting in a struggle for the empire to the hazard of the public interest and so many lives than from despair or distrust of his troops. For he had still in reserve and in full force those whom he had kept about him for a second trial of his fortune, and others were coming up from Dalmatia, Pannonia, and Moesia, nor were the troops lately defeated so far discouraged as not to be ready, even of themselves, to run all risks in order to wipe off their recent disgrace. My father... Suetonius Lenis was in this battle, being at that time an Angostoclavian tribune in the 13th legion. He used frequently to say that Otho, before his advancement to the empire, had such an abhorrence of civil war, that once, upon hearing an account given at table of the death of Cassius and Brutus, he fell into a trembling, and that he never would have interfered with Galba, but that he was confident of succeeding in his enterprise without a war. Moreover, that he was then encouraged to despise life by the example of a common soldier, who, bringing news of the defeat of the army, and finding that he met with no credit, but was railed at for a liar and a coward, as if he had run away from the field of battle, fell upon his sword at the emperor's feet. Upon the sight of which, my father said that Otho cried out that he would expose to no further danger such brave men who had deserved so well at his hands. Advising therefore his brother, 
his brother's son, and the rest of his friends, to provide for their security in the best manner they could, after he had embraced and kissed them, he sent them away, and then, withdrawing into a private room by himself, he wrote a letter of consolation to his sister, containing two sheets. He likewise sent another to Messalina, Nero's widow, whom he had intended to marry, committing to her the care of his relics and memory. He then burnt all the letters which he had by him, to prevent the danger and mischief that might otherwise befall the writers from the conqueror. What ready money he had, he distributed among his domestics. And now, being prepared, and just upon the point of dispatching himself, he was induced to suspend the execution of his purpose, by a great tumult which had broken out in the camp. Finding that some of the soldiers who were making off had been seized and detained as deserters, let us add, said he, this night to our life. These were his very words. He then gave orders that no violence should be offered to any one, and keeping his chamber door open until late at night, he allowed all who pleased the liberty to come and see him. At last, after quenching his thirst with a draught of cold water, he took up two poniards, and having examined the points of both, put one of them under his pillow, and shutting his chamber door, slept very soundly, until, awaking about break of day, he stabbed himself under the left pap. Some persons bursting into the room upon his first groan, he at one time covered, and at another exposed his wound to the view of the bystanders. And thus life soon ebbed away. His funeral was hastily performed, according to his own order, in the thirty-eighth year of his age, and ninety-fifth day of his reign. The person and appearance of Otho no way corresponded to the great spirit he displayed on this occasion, for he is said to have been of low stature, splay-footed, and bandy-legged. He was, however, effeminately nice in the care of his person. The hair on his body he plucked out by the roots, and because he was somewhat bald, he wore a kind of peruke so exactly fitted to his head that nobody could have known it for such. He used to shave every day, and rub his face with soaked bread, the use of which he began when the down first appeared upon his chin, to prevent his having any beard. It is said, likewise, that he celebrated publicly the sacred rites of Isis, clad in a linen garment such as is used by the worshippers of that goddess. These circumstances, I imagine, caused the world to wonder the more that his death was so little in character with his life. Many of the soldiers who were present, kissing and bedewing with their tears his hands and feet as he lay dead, and celebrating him as a most gallant man and an incomparable emperor, immediately put an end to their own lives upon the spot, not far from his funeral pile. Many of those likewise, who were at a distance, upon hearing the news of his death, in the anguish of their hearts, began fighting amongst themselves until they dispatched one another. To conclude, the generality of mankind, though they hated him whilst living, yet highly extolled him after his death, insomuch that it was the common talk and opinion that Galba had been driven to destruction by his rival, not so much for the sake of reigning himself, as of restoring Rome to its ancient liberty. End of Otho Recording by Andrew Coleman Vitellius from the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. 
The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester Vitellius Very different accounts are given of the origin of the Vitellian family. Some describe it as ancient and noble, others as recent and obscure, nay, extremely mean. I am inclined to think that these several representations have been made by the flatterers and detractors of Vitellius, after he became emperor, unless the fortunes of the family varied before. There is extant a memoir addressed by Quintus Eulogius to Quintus Vitellius, quaestor to the divine Augustus, in which it is said that the Vitellii were descended from Faunus, king of the Aborigines, and Vitellia, who was worshipped in many places as a goddess, and that they reigned formerly over the whole of Latium, that all who were left of the family removed out of the country of the Sabines to Rome, and were enrolled among the patricians, that some monuments of the family continued a long time, as the Vitellian Way, reaching from the Janiculum to the sea, and likewise a colony of that name, which, at a very remote period of time, they desired leave from the government to defend against the Iquicoli, with a force raised by their own family only. Also that, in the time of the war with the Samnites, some of the Vitellii, who went with the troops levied for the security of Apulia, settled at Nucaria, and their descendants, a long time afterwards, returned again to Rome, and were admitted into the patrician order. On the other hand, the generality of writers say that the founder of the family was a freedman. Cassius Severus and some others relate that he was likewise a cobbler, whose son, having made a considerable fortune by agencies and dealings in confiscated property, begot, by a common strumpet, daughter of one Antiochus, a baker, a child, who afterwards became a Roman knight. Of these different accounts, the reader is left to take his choice. It is certain, however, that Publius Vitellius of Nucaria, whether of an ancient family or of low extraction, was a Roman knight and a procurator to Augustus. He left behind him four sons, all men of very high station, who had the same cognomen, but the different prinomena of Aulus, Quintus, Publius, and Lucius. Aulus died in the enjoyment of the consulship, which office he bore jointly with Domitius, the father of Nero Caesar. He was elegant to excess in his manner of living, and notorious for the vast expense of his entertainments. Quintus was deprived of his rank of senator, when, upon a motion made by Tiberius, a resolution passed to purge the senate of those who were, in any respect, not duly qualified for that honour. Publius, an intimate friend and companion of Germanicus, prosecuted his enemy and murderer, Gnaeus Piso, and procured sentence against him. After he had been made proctor, being arrested among the accomplices of Sejanus, and delivered into the hands of his brother to be confined in his house, he opened a vein with a penknife, intending to bleed himself to death. He suffered, however, the wound to be bound up and cured, not so much from repenting the resolution he had formed, as to comply with the importunity of his relations. He died afterwards a natural death during his confinement. Lucius, after his consulship, was made governor of Syria, and by his politic management not only brought Artabanus, king of the Parthians, to give him an interview, but to worship the standards of the Roman legions. He afterwards filled two ordinary consulships, and also the censorship, jointly with the Emperor Claudius. Whilst that prince was absent upon his expedition into Britain, the care of the empire was committed to him, being a man of great integrity and industry. But he lessened his character not a little, by his passionate fondness for an abandoned freedwoman, with whose spittle, mixed with honey, he used to anoint his throat and jaws, by way of remedy for some complaint, not privately nor seldom, 
but daily and publicly. Being extravagantly prone to flattery, it was he who gave rise to the worship of Caius Caesar as a god, when upon his return from Syria he would not presume to accost him any otherwise than with his head covered, turning himself round, and then prostrating himself upon the earth. And to leave no artifice untried to secure the favour of Claudius, who was entirely governed by his wives and freedmen, he requested as the greatest favour for Messalina that she would be pleased to let him take off her shoes, which when he had done, he took her right shoe and wore it constantly betwixt his toga and his tunic, and from time to time covered it with kisses. He likewise worshipped golden images of Narcissus and Pallas among his household gods. It was he, too, who, when Claudius exhibited the secular games, in his compliments to him upon that occasion, used this expression, May you often do the same. He died of palsy, the day after his seizure with it, leaving behind him two sons, whom he had by a most excellent and respectable wife, Sextilia. He had lived to see them both consuls, the same year and during the whole year also, the younger succeeding the elder for the last six months. The Senate honoured him after his decease with a funeral at the public expense, and with a statue in the rostra, which had this inscription upon the base, one who was steadfast in his loyalty to his prince. The Emperor Aulus Vitellius, the son of this Lucius, was born upon the 8th of the canons of October, or, as some say, upon the 7th of the Ides of September, in the consulship of Drusus Caesar and Norbanus Flaccus. His parents were so terrified with the predictions of astrologers upon the calculation of his nativity, that his father used his utmost endeavours to prevent his being sent governor into any of the provinces, whilst he was alive. His mother, upon his being sent to the legions, and also upon his being proclaimed emperor, immediately lamented him as utterly ruined. He spent his youth amongst the catamites of Tiberius at Capri, was himself constantly stigmatised with the name of Spintria, and was supposed to have been the occasion of his father's advancement by consenting to gratify the emperor's unnatural lust. In the subsequent part of his life, being still most scandalously vicious, he rose to great favour at court, being upon a very intimate footing with Caius, because of his fondness for chariot-driving, and with Claudius for his love of gaming. But he was in a still higher degree acceptable to Nero, as well on the same accounts, as for a particular service which he rendered him. When Nero presided in the games instituted by himself, though he was extremely desirous to perform amongst the harpers, yet his modesty would not permit him, notwithstanding the people entreated much for it. Upon his quitting the theatre, Vitellius fetched him back again, pretending to represent the determined wishes of the people, and so afforded him the opportunity of yielding to their entreaties. By the favour of these three princes, he was not only advanced to the great offices of state, but to the highest dignities of the sacred order, after which he held the proconsulship of Africa, and had the superintendence of the public works, in which appointment his conduct, and consequently his reputation, were very different. For he governed the province with singular integrity during two years, in the latter of which he acted as deputy to his brother, who succeeded him. But in his office in the city he was said to pillage the temples of their gifts and ornaments, and to have exchanged brass and tin for gold and silver. He took to wife Petronia, the daughter of a man of consular rank, and had by her a son named Petronius, who was blind of an eye. The mother being willing to appoint this youth her heir, upon condition that he should be released from his father's authority, the latter discharged him accordingly. But shortly after, as was believed, murdered him, 
charging him with a design upon his life, and pretending that he had, from consciousness of his guilt, drank the poison he had prepared for his father. Soon afterwards he married Galeria Fundana, the daughter of a man of Praetorian rank, and had by her both sons and daughters. Among the former was one who had such a stammering in his speech that he was little better than if he had been dumb. He was sent by Galba into Lower Germany, contrary to his expectation. It is supposed that he was assisted in procuring this appointment by the interest of Titus Junius, a man of great influence at that time, whose friendship he had long before gained by favouring the same set of charioteers with him in the Circensian Games. But Galba openly declared that none were less to be feared than those who only cared for their bellies, and that even his enormous appetite must be satisfied with the plenty of that province, so that it is evident he was selected for that government more out of contempt than kindness. It is certain that when he was to set out he had not money for the expenses of his journey, he being at that time so much straitened in his circumstances that he was obliged to put his wife and children whom he left at rome into a poor lodging which he hired for them in order that he might let his own house for the remainder of the year and he pawned a pearl taken from his mother's earring to defray his expenses on the road a crowd of creditors who were waiting to stop him and amongst them the people of sinusa and formia and whose taxes he had converted to his own use, he eluded by alarming them with the apprehension of false accusation. He had, however, sued a certain freedman, who was clamorous in demanding a debt of him, under pretense that he had kicked him, which action he would not withdraw, until he had wrung from the freedman fifty thousand sesterces. Upon his arrival in the province, the army, which was disaffected to Galba and ripe for insurrection, received him with open arms, as if he had been sent to them from heaven. It was no small recommendation to their favour that he was the son of a man who had been thrice consul, was in the prime of life, and of an easy, prodigal disposition. This opinion, which had been long entertained of him, Vitellius confirmed by some late practices, having kissed all the common soldiers whom he met with upon the road, and been excessively complacent in the inns and stables to the muleteers and travellers, asking them in a morning if they had got their breakfasts, and letting them see, by belching, that he had eaten his. After he had reached the camp, he denied no man anything he asked for, and pardoned all who lay under sentence for disgraceful conduct or disorderly habits. Before a month, therefore, had passed, without regard to the day or season, he was hurried by the soldiers out of his bedchamber, although it was evening, and he in an undress, and unanimously saluted by the title of Emperor. He was then carried round the most considerable towns in the neighbourhood, with a sword of the divine Julius in his hand, which had been taken by some person out of the temple of Mars, and presented to him when he was first saluted. Nor did he return to the praetorium until its dining-room was in flames from the chimneys taking fire. Upon this accident, all being in consternation, and considering it as an unlucky omen, he cried out, Courage, boys! It shines brightly upon us! and this was all he said to the soldiers. The army of the upper province likewise, which had before declared against Galba for the senate, joining in the proceedings, he very eagerly accepted the cognomen of Germanicus, offered him by the unanimous consent of both armies, but deferred assuming that of Augustus, and refused for ever that of Caesar. Intelligence of Galba's death, arriving soon after, when he had settled his affairs in Germany, he divided his troops into two bodies, intending to send one of them before him against Otho, and to follow with the other himself. The army he sent forward had a lucky omen, for suddenly an eagle came flying up to them on the right, and having hovered round the standards, flew gently before them on their road. But, on the other hand, when he began his own march, 
all the equestrian statues which were erected for him in several places fell suddenly down with their legs broken and the laurel crown which he had put on as emblematical of auspicious fortune fell off his head into a river soon afterwards at vienne as he was upon the tribunal administering justice a cock perched upon his shoulder and afterwards upon his head the issue corresponded to these omens for he was not able to keep the empire which had been secured for him by his lieutenants he heard of the victory at bedriacum and the death of otho while he was yet in gaul and without the least hesitation, by a single proclamation, disbanded all the Praetorian cohorts, as having, by their repeated treasons, set a dangerous example to the rest of the army, commanding them to deliver up their arms to his tribunes, a hundred and twenty of them, under whose hands he had found petitions presented to Otho for rewards of their service in the murder of Galba, he besides ordered to be sought out and punished. So far his conduct deserved approbation, and was such as to afford hope of his becoming an excellent prince, had he not managed his other affairs in a way more corresponding with his own disposition, and his former manner of life, than to the imperial dignity. For, having begun his march, he rode through every city in his route in a triumphal procession, and sailed down the rivers in ships, fitted out with the greatest elegance, and decorated with various kinds of crowns, amidst the most extravagant entertainments. Such was the want of discipline, and the licentiousness both in his family and army, that, not satisfied with the provision everywhere made for them at the public expense, they committed every kind of robbery and insult upon the inhabitants, setting slaves at liberty as they pleased, and if any dared to make resistance, they dealt blows and abuse, frequently wounds, and sometimes slaughter amongst them. When he reached the plains on which the battles were fought, some of those around him being offended at the smell of the carcasses which lay rotting upon the ground, he had the audacity to encourage them by a most detestable remark, that a dead enemy smelt not amiss, especially if he were a fellow-citizen. To qualify, however, the offensiveness of the stench, he quaffed in public a goblet of wine, and with equal vanity and insolence distributed a large quantity of it among his troops. On his observing a stone with an inscription upon it to the memory of Otho, he said, It was a mausoleum good enough for such a prince. He also sent the poniard, with which Otho killed himself, to the colony of Agrippina, to be dedicated to Mars. Upon the Apennine hills he celebrated a Bacchanalian feast. At last he entered the city with trumpets sounding, in his general's cloak, and girded with his sword, amidst a display of standards and banners, his attendants being all in the military habit, and the arms of the soldiers unsheathed acting more and more in open violation of all laws, both divine and human, he assumed the office of Pontifex Maximus, upon the day of the defeat at the Alia, ordered the magistrates to be elected for ten years of office, and made himself consul for life. To put it out of all doubt what model he intended to follow in his government of the empire, he made his offerings to the shade of Nero in the midst of the Campus Martius, and with a full assembly of the public priests attending him. And at a solemn entertainment he desired a harper, who pleased the company much, to sing something in praise of Domitius. And upon his beginning some songs of Nero's, he started up in presence of the whole assembly, and could not refrain from applauding him by clapping his hands. After such a commencement of his career, he conducted his affairs, during the greater part of his reign, entirely by the advice and direction of the vilest amongst the players and charioteers, and especially his freedman, Asiaticus. This fellow had, when young, been engaged with him in a course of mutual and unnatural pollution, but being at last quite tired of the occupation, ran away. His master, some time after, caught him at Puteoli, selling a liquor called Posca, 
and put him in chains, but soon released him and retained him in his former capacity. Growing weary, however, of his rough and stubborn temper, he sold him to a strolling fencing master, after which, when the fellow was to have been brought up to play his part at the conclusion of an entertainment of gladiators, he suddenly carried him off, and at length, upon his being advanced to the government of a province, gave him his freedom. The first day of his reign, he presented him with the gold rings at supper, though in the morning, when all about him requested that favour in his behalf, he expressed the utmost abhorrence of putting so great a stain upon the equestrian order. He was chiefly addicted to the vices of luxury and cruelty. He always made three meals a day, sometimes four, breakfast, dinner and supper, and a drunken revel after all. This load of victuals he could well enough bear, from a custom to which he had inured himself, of frequently vomiting. For these several meals he would make different appointments at the houses of his friends on the same day. None ever entertained him at less expense than four hundred thousand sesterces. The most famous was a set entertainment given him by his brother, at which it is said there were served up no less than two thousand choice fishes and seven thousand birds. Yet even this supper he himself outdid at a feast which he gave upon the first use of a dish which had been made for him, and which, for its extraordinary size, he called the Shield of Minerva. In this dish there were tossed up together the livers of charfish, the brains of pheasants and peacocks, with the tongues of flamingos, and the entrails of lampreys, which had been brought in ships of war as far as from the Carpathian Sea and the Spanish Straits. He was not only a man of an in insatiable appetite, but would gratify it likewise at unseasonable times, and with any garbage that came in his way so that, at a sacrifice, he would snatch from the fire flesh and cakes, and eat them upon the spot. When he travelled, he did the same at the inns upon the road, whether the meat was fresh, dressed, and hot, or what had been left the day before, and was half eaten. He delighted in the infliction of punishments, and even those which were capital, without any distinction of persons or occasions, Several noblemen, his schoolfellows and companions, invited by him to court, he treated with such flattering caresses as seemed to indicate an affection short only of admitting them to share the honours of the imperial dignity. Yet he put them all to death by some base means or other. To one he gave poison with his own hand in a cup of cold water which he called for in a fever. He scarcely spared one of all the usurers, notaries, and publicans who had ever demanded a debt of him at Rome, or any toll or custom upon the road. One of these, while in the very act of saluting him, he ordered for execution, but immediately sent for him back, upon which all about him, applauding his clemency, he commanded him to be slain in his own presence, saying, I have a mind to feed my eyes. Two sons who interceded for their father, he ordered to be executed with him. A Roman knight, upon his being dragged away for execution, and crying out to him, You are my heir! He desired to produce his will, and finding that he had made his freedman joint heir with him, he commanded that both he and the freedman should have their throats cut. He put to death some of the common people for cursing aloud the blue party in the Circensian games, supposing it to be done in contempt of himself and the expectation of a revolution in the government. There were no persons he was more severe against than jugglers and astrologers, and as soon as any one of them was informed against, he put him to death without the formality of a trial. He was enraged against them, because, after his proclamation, by which he commanded all astrologers to quit home, and Italy also, before the calends of October, a bill was immediately posted about the city, with the following words, Take notice, 
the Chaldeans also decree that Vitellius Germanicus shall be no more by the day of the said Calends. He was even suspected of being accessory to his mother's death by forbidding sustenance to be given her when she was unwell. A German witch, whom he held to be oracular, having told him that he would long reign in security if he survived his mother. But others say that being quite weary of the state of affairs and apprehensive of the future, she obtained without difficulty a dose of poison from her son. In the eighth month of his reign, the troops both in Mosia and Pannonia revolted from him, as did likewise of the armies beyond sea, those in Judea and Syria, some of which swore allegiance to Vespasian as emperor in his own presence, and others in his absence. In order, therefore, to secure the favour and affection of the people, Vitellius lavished on all around whatever he had it in his power to bestow, both publicly and privately, in the most extravagant manner. He also levied soldiers in the city, and promised all who enlisted as volunteers not only their discharge after the victory was gained, but all the rewards due to veterans who had served their full time in the wars. The enemy now pressing forward, both by sea and land, on one hand he opposed against them his brother with a fleet, the new levies, and a body of gladiators, and in another quarter the troops and generals who were engaged at Bedriacum, but being beaten, or betrayed in every direction, he agreed with Flavius Sabinus, Vespasian's brother, to abdicate on condition of having his life spared, and a hundred millions of sesterces granted him, and he immediately, upon the palace steps, publicly declared to a large body of soldiers there assembled, that he resigned the government which he had accepted reluctantly. But they, all remonstrating against it, he deferred the conclusion of the treaty. Next day, early in the morning, he came down to the forum in a very mean habit, and with many tears repeated the declaration from a writing which he held in his hand. But the soldiers and people again interposing, and encouraging him not to give way, but to rely on their zealous support, he recovered his courage, and forced Sabinus, with the rest of the Flavian party, who now thought themselves secure, to retreat into the capital, where he destroyed them all by setting fire to the temple of Jupiter, whilst he beheld the contest, and the fire from Tiberius's house, where he was feasting. Not long after, Repenting of what he had done, and throwing the blame of it upon others, he called a meeting, and swore that nothing was dearer to him than the public peace, which oath he also obliged the rest to take. Then drawing a dagger from his side, he presented it first to the consul, and upon his refusing it, to the magistrates, and then to every one of the senators, but none of them being willing to accept it, he went away as if he meant to lay it up in the temple of Concord. But some crying out to him, You are Concord! He came back again, and said that he would not only keep his weapon, but for the future use the cognomen of Concord. He advised the Senate to send deputies, accompanied by the Vestal Virgins, to desire peace, or at least time for consultation. The day after, while he was waiting for an answer, he received intelligence by a scout that the enemy was advancing. Immediately, therefore, throwing himself into a small litter, borne by hand with only two attendants, a baker and a cook, he privately withdrew to his father's house on the Aventine Hill, intending to escape thence into Campania. But a groundless report being circulated that the enemy was willing to come to terms, he suffered himself to be carried back to the palace. Finding, however, nobody there, and those who were with him stealing away, he girded round his waist a belt full of gold pieces, and then ran into the porter's lodge, tying the dog before the door, and piling up against it the bed and bedding. By this time, the forerunners of the enemy's army had broken into the palace, and meeting with nobody, searched, as was natural, every corner, being dragged by them out of his cell, and asked who he was, for they did not recognise him, and if he knew where Vitellius was, he deceived them by a falsehood. 
but at last being discovered, he begged hard to be detained in custody, even were it in a prison, pretending to have something to say which concerned Vespasian's security. Nevertheless, he was dragged half-naked into the forum, with his hands tied behind him, a rope about his neck, and his clothes torn, amidst the most contemptuous abuse, both by word and deed, along the Via Sacra, his head being held back by the hair, in the manner of condemned criminals, and the point of a sword put under his chin, that he might hold up his face to public view. Some of the mob, meanwhile, pelting him with dung and mud, whilst others called him an incendiary and glutton. They also upbraided him with the defects of his person, for he was monstrously tall, and had a face usually very red with hard drinking, a large belly, and one thigh weak, occasioned by a chariot running against him, as he was attending upon Caius while he was driving. At length, upon the Scalae Gemoniae, he was tormented and put to death in lingering tortures, and then dragged by a hook into the Tiber. He perished with his brother and son in the fifty-seventh year of his age, and verified the prediction of those who, from the omen which happened to him at Vienne, as before related, foretold that he would be made prisoner by some man of Gaul, for he was seized by Antoninus Primus, a general of the adverse party, who was born at Toulouse, and, when a boy, had the cognomen of Becco, which signifies a cock's beak. End of Vitellius Recording by Andrew Coleman